Welcome to the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight webcast series. Today's conference will start in a moment. The WFS is dedicated to educating technology leaders through webcasts like these and the Growth and Exit Strategies conference series held in London, New York, Silicon Valley, and other tech and financial centers around the world. The speakers and sponsors of these live events read like a who's who of industry leaders. To learn more about our live events for CEOs, owners, and investors, or to access our library of on-demand spotlight webcasts covering markets like IT security, health tech, gaming, and more, please visit WFS.com. And now, let's join today's Market Spotlight webcast. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our Market Spotlight today, the theme tax bill and tech M&A, a very hot topic. I'm Bruce Milne, CEO of the Quorum Group, the platinum sponsor of this conference. I'll be your moderator today, and I'm delighted to be joined by M&A specialist Joel Esterlin. Joel, thanks for coming. Glad to be here. Thanks, Bruce. So let's get right to the topic here, because I know we're going to have some questions. The tax bill and tech M&A, how will it impact you? Uh, and a lot of you are looking at going to market shortly, and what are the things you need to think about? Well, we broke it down into the good, the bad, and the unexpected. And we've, we're going to be joined by some guest presenters. I got to choose first, so I chose the good. The first part, and this is, this is kind of the, the headline, is the lower corporate tax rates. Now, this is for C corporations. Uh, it gets a little murky after that, as you'll see. But the C corporation rate goes from 35 to 21. And you may ask yourself, how in the world did they pick those numbers? I mean, why isn't it 25 or 13 or whatever? If you've been reading the press or you're familiar with these things because you have international operations, 20% is about the average rate in developed countries around the world. So we're now competitive. We weren't competitive before, which forced corporations to keep their cash offshore. And boy, did they, as we'll see some, from some charts coming up. The next one is an immediate impact. It starts today, actually last week, an increase in capital expenditures. As this headline shows, AT&T affirms plans to boost capital spending on the heels of the tax reform. There's huge incentives built in for write-offs and to go ahead and, and buy capital equipment. That will be pumping up the economy and, we think, driving the stock market. The next point is the U.S. will no longer be taxing worldwide income. In other words, we're coming into line with the rest of the taxation around the world, meaning that you pay taxes where you are, and then the rest of your taxes are in the U.S., but you don't pay double tax uh, as we have been doing in the past, where you pay taxes and then you pay uh, on the rest for at the U.S. tax rate. And this should be a big incentive. Uh, the only problem, as we'll see, is that when we get to the pass-throughs, the C-Corps, the LLCs, and that sort of thing. This is a big one. This is huge. Repatriation of foreign profits at 15.5%. Some of you may remember that going back, oh, I think it was 2006, I'm not sure, that you could repatriate at a one-time dividend rate. There was a window of repatriation at about 15% dividend. And that's kind of where that's 15.5. That All the way up to the very last day, literally, it was 15%. They changed it to 15.5 uh, to please some of Congress. But what this means is that there's a, a one-time repatriation. Uh, offshore, there's uh, different numbers, $2.8 trillion, a lot of money. How much of that, we don't know. But imagine if that's repatriated. Let's say $2 trillion of it. No one knows for sure. You know, and the government's getting 15.5% of it. That's going to be a big boost also to uh, your taxes coming in. And the other thing, too, is that the biggest beneficiary is going to be the tech companies. This headline here is Apple and tech companies to bring back $400 billion in overseas cash to the United States. Now, this is an estimate. We believe this is actually just tracking the major companies. It's our belief that the number will actually be a bit higher. And so we're expecting that to be used uh, for a number of things. One of them will be to, uh, to, to buy back stock, to pay dividends, and, a lot, and the number three will be for acquisitions. That will drive growth. The next one is continued growth in the market. I mean, right after this was announced, the Dow soared. I hope some of you had stocks because they just took off. As you'll see next week in our uh, World Tech M&A report for 2018, 
we just had the fastest 1,000 point movement in the Dow ever. And the point is, it's not going to stop. Warren Buffett came on two days ago and said it's not fully baked in. And the reasons are actually, are actually numerous. One is sort of the multiplier effect when you bring that much cash into your system. Now, keep in mind that when the cash was offshore, you could not invest it in American stocks. You couldn't loan it to yourself in the United States. You couldn't buy American real estate. You couldn't even buy an American stock on a foreign exchange. We think that money coming back is going to be doing a few things. One, be buying stocks, obviously, buying back stocks, paying dividends, all of which will drive the market up. So I'll follow Warren on this one. So that gets us through the good. We have lower corporate taxes and increase in capital expenditures. The, New York, the U.S. no longer taxing worldwide income. The repatriation, that'll be big. Cash influx will drive continued growth in the market. And by the way, remember, when the stock market's up, tech M&A is up, too. Continued growth will also support tech and M&A. And we'll come back to why that will be. So one of the things is that, is this, will this be a tech M&A fiesta? I kind of like this headline, I guess, because I love Mexico so much. But the headline is Trump's tax plan will help fuel tech acquisitions. Let's drill down a little bit. Let's take the top 50 companies with foreign cash. And I can't read this, so I assume you can't, but trust me, there's a lot of big companies on here from Apple, Microsoft on down. Now, we circled the ones for you that are green. This is all corporations. And what do you notice? About half of all the companies with foreign cash hoards are tech. Now, we've also circled some that are in sort of yellow or orange. Those are non-technology companies that have bought tech. Let's take a look at the next 50, next 25. Guess what? Again, it's 50%. In other words, a massive amount of the cash offshore is tech. It's going to come back and it's going to tech you. But let's take a look at the shares of the of this held offshore in this next slide. What's interesting here and why this is important is that take a look at these. And these are the largest hoards offshore, the largest up to the right being, being Apple with over $200 billion. Um, the average of the technology companies is around is going up and down 71 to 73 percent for all companies. And that's not just the big ones because we have a lot of secondary companies too. Uh, and on that list, for example, you saw we had you know Citrix, Agilent, Xilinx, uh, Trimble, who we just sold a company to in Amsterdam last week. These are companies in the secondary group of these uh, tech companies that will be bringing cash over, and they need the cash even more because they're very aggressive in acquisitions maybe even more aggressive than the first tier, particularly for smaller companies. But one of the things I want you to look at is, that, let's say Johnson & Johnson here, and you can read that, it's the one on the far left, 98.6% of their cash is offshore. PepsiCo, almost 97%. So it's not just the tech companies, it's everybody. The point is, what happens when you have that amount of money coming into your economy? Trillions of dollars. The multiplier effect says business should go up, and we think so. Because remember, these companies, the reason they have so much company, so much offshore, is that these are multinationals. That's the strength of American corporations, is that they are global. And America is only 6% of the world population. So guess what? They're selling 94% is offshore. And that, guess what? That's just about math the numbers we're seeing here. So not only in tech, but also in non-tech. And non-tech will be playing more of a role, as we'll see in a minute. Now, let's go to the, to the back. Joel? Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> I do agree that that repatriation of cash by the non-tech buyers is a real trend to watch. So in any reform of this scale, uh, in addition to uh, you've got to take the good with the bad. <clears throat> and there are a few things to look for in the reform that may have gotten overlooked that could prove to be traps for the unwary. The first is the end of carrybacks on net operating losses, or NOLs as they're known in the industry. Now, NOLs, particularly in early-stage venture-backed tech companies, have been a big deal because obviously these companies are generating significant, significant losses prior to profitability. These limits um, are going to make it tougher uh, to leverage those NOLs going forward and, uh, and could affect uh, the valuations on certain companies uh, that, carry, that uh, previously had those big NOLs on the books. The second issue that I think um, people need to consider is the change in the treatment of patent sales. 
previously patent sales were treated as capital gains, but going forward, patent sales are going to be taxed as ordinary income. And so for those really looking at trying to bundle up IP or sell IP in asset sales or divestitures, this could be a, a, a big change. Fortunately, most of the clients we see, the value is in the customers, the revenue stream, the product itself, and the teams, uh, not just the patents. And so we see this having a relatively minor effect um, on the typical going concern uh, type successful private software company. Next, there's always some accounting changes when we do uh, tax reform at this scale. Here, and this uh, sort of may have uh, snuck past some people, pretty significant accounting change for the software industry. There's a requirement now that going forward, people are going to have to capitalize software R&D over five years. Now, sort of best practice or the norm in the industry has been to encourage folks to expense all of that R&D, take it in the current year, and run it through the P&L. And so both on the buy side and the sell side, that's going to create a significant change for people, both in thinking about businesses and in looking at financial statements. Probably the biggest change, I think, for people on this call, so really pause and, and focus here, is to remember that these new low tax rates are only for C-Corps. What we've seen over the past decade is a real move on the part of technology entrepreneurs to uh, organize their businesses as pass-through entities, both S-Corps, LLCs, and the like. And particularly for profitable uh, software companies, this was a good move uh, in, in a tax-efficient strategy. But given that these low tax rates do not extend uh, to the pass-through entities, the cuts in individual rates are relatively modest, um, and the limitations on those pass-through entities are pretty significant. That's, we're going to return to that topic. Uh, in just a moment. The next topic that folks probably did get some exposure to because it came up in all the headlines about the individual changes is that state taxes are no longer deductible. The point here, obviously, is that this affects businesses, not just individuals. And so, particularly for profitable technology and software companies in high tax states, here we're thinking obviously California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, uh, Oregon, that uh, that's going to be a significant uh, hit uh, to those folks to uh, not, no longer be able to deduct those state taxes. Next is a significant interest, a significant limitation on the deduction of business interest. So traditionally, remember, business interest was essentially deductible uh, without limitation. Uh, heavily used by PE funds and other buyout funds in highly leveraged deals. Those limits um, are going to uh, drive people, we think, towards more use of cash or we'll return to that uh, at the close. Well, what's interesting there uh, is that I, we have our annual panel in February and putting that together now, including all the top private equity firms, and we, we pose this question to them, will it slow them down? The answer is not really. Uh, they're, they have a voracious appetite through their holding companies, portfolio companies for acquisitions. And while this, this does affect them, I don't think it will slow it down. That's our initial read. Yeah, absolutely. The final point on the bad side is just the uncertainty regarding this magnitude of change. People uh, have often taken years, some, some cases even decades, to develop their legacy optimized tax structures, both in the U.S. and overseas. And this level of sea change is going to cause people to have to do a lot of rethinking, restructuring, um, and uh, reconsidering how they think about both their own financial statements as well as those of Target. So it's going to take people a, a, a little bit to digest these changes. They're still, they're still talking it through. I mean, and as you said, we're going to have a little bit more on structure here in a couple of minutes. Before we do that, I'd like to go to contributor Bruce Lazenby. He's on the faculty of the World Financial Symposium for a very important point. Bruce? The Economist predicts that 2018 will be the year that big incumbent companies take on big tech. Over the last four years, 42% of all the growth in stock markets across North America has gone to technology companies. Last year, Ford fired its CEO despite near record profits because the board felt that he was too complacent about technology changes. Traditional companies need to develop a digital solution to survive and grow. But what we know is that they typically don't know how to do this. 
So what do we think it means for our clients? We think it means that companies who know they need to make a change but aren't too sure how to do it are going to be looking for acquisitions to help them along that process. That means that companies that have typically not been acquirers of smaller technology companies might become good buyers. Nobody wants to be the next Kodak. Indeed. I just saw, what was it, a a cryptocurrency from Kodak resurrecting themselves in the ether. Um, let me let me expand on this point. That's a great one, Bruce, because this actually we've been seeing this trend for some time and talking about it. Um, some of you uh, uh, will bring up here a Bosch uh, is an example. We did this uh, better part of a decade ago, and, and they bought a company called Inubit, which was a leader in the IoT space, and they outbid Google. Now, when you think of Bosch, I, I just saw an ad for yesterday for a new kind of brake lining and auto parts, and I think I have a Bosch dishwasher. The point is this is not a tech company, but they realized some time ago, like a lot of firms are, that tech's going to be part of their life. Since they make high-end things and the added value is going to be, you know, uh, in terms of a digital form, they realized they needed to be controlling their own destiny, so they wanted to control a technology in the IoT space. And now they're one of the major players in the world. they got to jump a head start in this. But carry that forward, just last week, Bosch and Continental bought stakes in digital mapping company here. Now, you may not know of here, $3.5 billion valuation, mostly investment by the European auto companies. But Continental, you don't think of Continental, for example, as a tech company. Continental is the world's second largest tire company. So we have somebody who makes auto parts and tires playing in, in this game with digital mapping, and what else are they doing? Well, as we see in the next slide, they're teaming up with Baidu on the self-driving technology. Did you all know that Bosch and Continental were leading the charge here? And it doesn't stop there. In the next slide, we see that they're joining up with BMW, Intel, Mobileye, you know that one, the platform for self-driving cars. The point is, in almost every industry, we're seeing that, you know, technology is going to be the future, and these these non-technology companies had better figure that out, as Bruce said. All right, let's, let's go towards the, the, the end here in the, in the conclusions. So what does all this mean? The unexpected. Joel? Sure, Bruce. <clears throat> the first one here <clears throat> is I think we're going to see more deals structured as asset sales. Remember, traditionally, sellers have strongly favored stock purchase deals, meaning sales of their equity in the business, uh, in order to get long-term capital gains and only have a single level of tax. Asset sales were strongly disfavored because you're talking about two levels of tax and particularly that C-Corp tax on the gain from the asset. But with this dramatic reduction in the tax rate on C-Corps, uh, I think we're going to see a significant shift towards some buyers getting their way and structuring deals as assets. Yeah, that tax differential, uh, the 30, the difference in, in, in the ordinary income versus the capital gains has been a big issue. Now we're getting closer and closer. You know, one of the ones that I've noticed is that lesser-known U.S. tech buyers, and I, I addressed some of those in that list. There's a lot of smaller firms that don't get the headlines every day, but they also have very they're, – they're very acquisitive. We find that some of the second- and third-tier strategic buyers are some of the most active, as well as the private equity firms for their portfolio companies. And to them, the repatriation of funds means even more because they will put it to work because they're aggressively buying, like as I mentioned, the deal with Trimble last week. Yeah, absolutely agree. Strong balance sheets are going to lead to deals. So I think which leads into our next point, which is just more cash deals entirely. I think in this post-repatriation environment, cash is going to be king. That both means relative to stock deals, but also relative to folks who may have been trying to use debt to get themselves into deals. I think the cash buyers are going to be at a significant advantage. You know, I'm going to pick up on what Bruce Lazenby said. Is I think there'll be a surge in non-traditional strategic uh, buyers, as I just mentioned, the small companies. And so I, I, I expect to see a lot more of that. We're already seeing it now. We're having a record January, and a lot of these companies that are in the hunt are not your traditional buyers, and they're all over the world. So the next point really echoes on that quote from Warren Buffett earlier, which is how do we value companies in general? I think there needs to be a rethinking of EBITDA. Remember, the T in EBITDA stands for taxes, and the traditional view has been that tax rates don't matter, 
And so that when you look at companies on an EBITDA basis, it doesn't matter what the underlying tax rate is. Um, I think you're going to see a, a move back to valuing companies or at least consideration of value on a bottom line after tax earnings and also cash flow basis uh, as we look at the huge impact that those lower tax rates are going to have on actual cash flows. I, I totally agree. Cash flow is the operative word here. That makes U.S. targets more attractive to international buyers, and about 70% of our transactions involve a non-U.S. buyer or seller. So we're going to see a pickup in activity there. And, you know, an interesting thing related to that is we think there'll be more U.S. startups. You would never dream of setting up a company in the U.S. before if you were an offshore firm and running your sales through that because of the tax structure. We may have more U.S. startups that are done by others offshore. Absolutely. One slightly more subtle point is a change to a three-year holding period to get long-term capital gains on carried interest. This applies, obviously, on the buy side to PE funds and other folks with a carried interest model. This could make it tough on folks looking to buy and quickly sell up, essentially flip companies from one PE fund to another. I think you're going to see that three-year holding period become the norm uh, as people get into deals. That will affect the private equity firms, and we'll hear from them in February. The last one is penalties and offshore tax havens. And this one, if you've read about it, is this foreign-derived intangible income. There's still some questions about, around this. In fact, there's still a lot of questions. I'd like to go to our contributor, John Woodruff, from the Posanelli firm, one of our co-sponsors. John? There are several unexpected issues and opportunities arising out of the Act that I haven't heard much discussion of. There are new thin capitalization limitations on the deduction of interest which essentially limit the total interest deduction a corporation can take to 30% of its EBIT for now and beginning in 2022, 30% of its EBITDA. Unlike the earnings stripping rules, the limitation does not apply solely to related party debt. Accordingly, PE-backed companies and others with significant leverage may see increases in their tax bills. Another interesting aspect of the Act is that while it purports to limit the shifting of intangibles offshore, it actually increases the incentives to do so. Under the Act, U.S. taxpayers must generally include in their income all returns of their controlled foreign corporations in excess of a 10% margin on the foreign corporation's base, tax basis in tangible depreciable assets. Since tech companies tend not to have significant tangible assets, most of the income of their foreign subsidiaries will be subject to immediate U.S. corporate tax. However, since they receive a 50% deduction for the income included, the effective rate of U.S. tax is only 10.5%, which is a significant incentive to develop IP offshore. Finally, there's an interesting tax incentive for equity holders to defer tax on their capital gains by investing in qualified opportunity zones. In brief, if a capital gain is invested in a corporation or a partnership that uses the funds to invest in tangible property in certain designated poverty zones, the capital gain can be deferred until 2026 and reduced by up to 15%. Moreover, any gains on the disposal of the investment itself are exempt from tax if the investment is held for at least 10 years. Did you get all that? <laughs> this, will be, this will be on recorded on WFS.com. Uh, we'll also be following up with a special report on offshore structures and what poverty zones mean and a little bit on domestic. Yeah, great points, John. John, the one question I had is whether the tax reform is going to push people from pass-through entities back into C-Corps. In many cases, I do think you'll see a significant shift from pass-through entities to corporations. First, the corporate tax rate is almost 10 points lower than the effective rate on income earned by a pass-through, which is able to avail itself of the new qualified business income deduction. Second, the qualified business income deduction is limited to 50% of wages or 25% of wages plus 2.5% of investment in tangible depreciable property. For many tech companies, this limitation may substantially reduce the value of the qualified business income deduction. Since the maximum marginal rate on individuals is 37%, the corporate rate is 16 points higher. Meanwhile, the total effective rate on corporate earnings distributed back to shareholders is only a few points higher than the maximum individual rate. Finally, for tech companies that sell, license, or provide services for foreign use, 
Doing business through a corporation allows him to take a deduction for a portion of the income derived from these activities. Essentially, for income derived from such activities, in excess of 10% of the corporation's aggregate basis in depreciable tangible property used to produce the income, the rate of corporate tax is about 13% and the effective rate of tax on a distribution of corporate earnings to a shareholder is about 21%. These are powerful incentives to move investment from a pass-through entity to a corporation. And we'll have more on that in our special report. Uh, 16% that he's talking about, he called it up, but I might call it down, but that's 37 to 21%. You know, we're getting close to the end of our time here, so what's all this mean? What are our action items, Joel? Yeah, just really quick to sum up, I think folks are going to be looking to manage to profit as well as grow. So think about the bottom line and not just the top line. Second, obviously look at your offshore operations. What worked before may no longer be optimal. Third, as John just uh, so rightly pointed out, think about uh, if you're in a pass-through entity, whether that's the, the place you want to be going forward. And fourth, uh, and obviously most importantly, Bruce, think about this M&A window. Indeed, think about this M&A window. I've been doing this for 32 years. Quorum sold more uh, privately held tech companies than anybody, and I have never seen a market like this. They're, they're estimating that the overall M&A will be bumped by about 10%. I think tech will actually be higher because of the conditions that we talked about. We'll be talking about that more uh, next week in our World Tech M&A report, uh, where we'll be joined by IBM, Salesforce, and others. Um, and, and some of you uh, I'll be seeing in... Uh, in, the, in San Francisco, the World Financial Symposium there. We joined by Google, NetApp, Salesforce, Morgan Stanley, and TNA. So, TA, so I hope to see you, I hope to see you there. We're right at our, our finish time here. We've got time for a question or two. Joel, did we get anything? Any questions? Sure. Really quick, Bruce, a great question. Do I have to be a particular structure in order to go to market with an M&A process? Thankfully, no. Um, you can sell no matter what structure you are. The capital gains are still in there. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to be knowing more about this with our follow-on report, but uh, until they, they change the capital gains right now, uh, the, the, it doesn't matter what structure you are. So I, if, I have a lot of my friends asking me, is now the time? Yes, now's the time to calibrate this market. You know, you'll be able to find out, and you're going to get a lot of feedback. Doors, you'll learn, learn a lot, improve your model. Uh, we just had a company went to market, and they ended up getting two – uh, joint venture uh, agreements along the way that have bumped their value. That's the kind of market we're seeing today. And we're even seeing some aqua hires. So, no, the structure doesn't make any difference. Do we have other questions? Yeah, we have some others coming in, but unfortunately we're right at the end of our time here. So we'll get back to you with those from our, from our faculty. Again, thank you for joining us uh, in our conference today for the World Financial Symposium Tax and Tech M&A. We'll go to close. We hope you enjoy today's online symposium. If you have any questions not answered, please submit them to info at WFS.com. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming live events in a city near you. To register for these live events, view upcoming webcast topics, or hear rebroadcast of this or other market spotlight events, please go to WFS.com. Thank you for attending today's webcast.